What's up, volleyball fans? I'm Darren Tipton, and welcome to the VB Adrenaline Podcast. Our podcast, we will dive deep into the heart of the game, bringing you the hottest topics, prospects, and a buzz surrounding prep and college volleyball, especially the world of recruiting. In each episode, our crew will spotlight rising stars who are shaking up the national game. Plus, we will serve you the scoop on current events that have coaches and fans talking courtside. Tune in for the episodes that spotlight tomorrow's college stars, new trends in the sport, plus interviews that will keep you informed on the explosion that is volleyball in the USA. You can connect with us on social media, Instagram at vbadrenaline.com underscore and Twitter at vbadrenaline. Be part of the conversation. Share your thoughts on your favorite players, prospects, and predictions by using hashtag VBAdrenaline. So grab a seat, volleyball fans, and get ready to dive into the world of spikes, sets, and serves with the VB Adrenaline Podcast. See you there. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the VB Adrenaline Podcast, and I'm your host, Darren Tipton. And we talk about all things uh, throughout the volleyball world, and I've been excited for this episode for a couple weeks and i am joined today uh by the smiths um and jeff smith and marley smith and marley is a two-time guest um in about a month right marley yeah yeah and so marley was well is an all-american uh setter for legacy volleyball out of michigan and um a national champ yet or yeah a- national champ Yep, national champ, All-American, and um, class of 2027. And so the story goes that I watched Marley at Nationals, and we did an interview with her for the website. And as I was doing research for the interview, I saw a picture of her and her dad um, after a college basketball tournament and saw some pictures. And then I found out her dad was a college basketball coach and that's Jeff here. And so before we started recording last time, I started talking to Marley about March Madness. And of course, Marley told me you're a huge March Madness fan. Yes. Yes. And then we started talking recruiting. And I found out Marley knows more about recruiting than I do. And she <laughs> knows probably more about recruiting than... of the parents in the volleyball world um, and a lot of recruiting coordinators because of her dad. And so Marley, introduce everybody to your dad and kind of give them a history of what your dad does. So this is my dad. Um, He coaches at Oakland University here in Rochester, Michigan. Um, He's been coaching for 30 years, 30 years. And I honestly, going through the recruiting process, I think that my, he's really opened my eyes to what I want from a coach just because I've been around him for so long. And honestly, he's given me like the background to understand like how the process works and how recruiting works. And also just what, like basically how recruiting coordinators go about their business. And I think it really helps me understand both sides of recruiting. Yeah, and, and so first of all, Jeff, you're a basketball coach, not a volleyball coach, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cl- clarify that, um, and and talk about that first, Jeff. I I think that's what people miss, uh, especially on the parent, the fan side. There are two sides of this coin. Right? Yeah, there are for sure, and you know now with as she's going through this part of it. It's uh, it's different being on the other side. And what I've found, too, although I've been in college athletics for 30 years, the, the difference in the rules and the way recruiting happens in volleyball versus basketball is also very different. And yeah. it presents some challenges that uh, in, in what I found out is I, I don't think that the college volleyball coaches really enjoy the way the system is set up for them very much as well. I, I think that, you know, it's got to be very difficult. In some ways, it's very backwards because they can't talk with them until 
June 15th, and then they're asking them to make decisions on where they're going to go to school a year later in a matter of days. And so, you know, things like that. And, and fortunately, I've got my wife is a, is a high school coach and a club coach, but she started her career as a college coach. That's where we met. Um, when she was an assistant coach when uh, we both were at Oakland University the first time. And so she's been able to help me understand it as a parent because as a, as a college coach and as a recruiter, it's, it's very different from what I do and what I have done. And so that part of it has been interesting, but certainly being the parent is very, very different than being the coach. And, um, but what I've tried to do is what I always encourage parents of the young men whom I'm recruiting to do, and that's ask a lot of questions, get as much information as you can, and be there to be a sounding board for your, in my case, daughter. I always say, you know, for your son, but, you know, for her, there's a lot of times, like, I'll ask her questions and try to get feedback from her about, you know, what she's thinking and what she's looking for. And, and I've tried to do that for some of the parents on her club team. Some of them have come up and asked me, you know, and I, I think sometimes they think they're, you know, they're bothering me or whatever. And I say, I'm, I'm here. I'm happy to help you in any way that I can. Because it's it's a it's a very strange process. It's a process that at times people can get very very caught up in as parents and lose sight of what's really important. And so, if I can help with this podcast, or if I can help other parents and other recruits, I'm more than happy to do that. And that's kind of what I'm doing. I mean, that's how I came into all this. Was we followed a recruit from South Dakota a few years ago and. I talk about being an old football coach and I was like, Oh, she's probably been to this camp and what coaches do, does she like? And supposedly she's really good. Right. So where's she going? She has no clue. What do you mean? She has no clue. Oh, well, she can't talk to coaches yet. What do you mean? Yeah. That's really silly. Yeah. It is really silly. And, and so I have a million coaches uh, questions for you. So anyways, to our followers, what we thought as I was talking with Marley, I'm like, this is perfect. Why not bring you both in here? And this is kind of why we were created is for this. Um, and so we'll just start firing away. And Marley, I want you, if you know the answers to some of these two, you jump in because what I was so fascinated with is your level of knowledge. And I think girls and athletes your age need to hear it because it concerns me a little bit how little some of them know, and I get it. They're 15 and going on 16, but as quick as they're committing, like you talk about days and some of them it's hours, right? And they better be asking questions now if they're going to commit that quick. Um, and I think the other thing is not saying don't, but be prepared ahead of time. Right, because how long are your basketball recruits visiting, camping, right? Like how long are they going through a process before they're verbaling? Um, well, you know, how long? Before the transfer portal, it was at times three plus years. You know, we would have them try to identify them when they were freshmen and, and, and certainly by the time they were sophomores. And, you know, you maybe couldn't talk with them when you went into their gyms, but you would get them up the campus as often as you could for unofficial visits and have them at your games, have them at your camp, uh, have them come watch you practice. And, and you'd be able to sit down and talk with them when they were on campus and <clears throat> they can't do that. You know, yeah. we went, you know, I, I only went to one camp with Marley and, uh, you know, she can share a little bit more about her experience going to some of the other camps, but you know, there's, there's almost no conversation that's being had between the campers and the coaches other than instruction of the drills where in basketball, I mean, we got those kids in our office and with the parents and, you know, you're showing them around campus and, and you're, you're laying out the carpet, the red carpet for them and making yes. them feel as welcome as you can, where, you know, the visit that we went on, that I went on with her, I mean, we, we did everything on our own, which it was fine, but it's just, it's very, very different. Yeah. Well, and, and I think they lose that sight, you know, all, I hear the the negative side too, going through, you know, with the 26 is about how they got their hopes up and then, you know, they were strong. They had no idea where they sat with the school. 
basketball recruits probably have a better idea because of how you guys interact with them along the way. Like I'm guessing, right? Like, I mean, you roll out more red carpet for your number one, correct? For sure. But that's the process they actually get to go through. And, and maybe this is getting way deep and off track and there's probably some volleyball coach out there like you have no clue and I probably don't. But if we know it's that broken, right? And if you know it's that messed up, why why can't why does it take so long to change? Uh, I think anytime you're you're dealing with the NCAA and legislation, that. it's always gonna it's always gonna be and I would never want to speak for the volleyball coaches. I just I know talking with our coaches at Oakland um, and other coaches that I know, not the ones that are recruiting Marley, just with other coaches with whom I've worked, when I ask them about that, and they say the same thing that, you know, but it's to get those things changed sometimes, it, you know, we've gone through that where it, it took us a long time to where we could talk with, have those kids come on campus when they were younger, and we'd go back and forth with those types of rule changes all the time. So it's, it's uh, it's a tough thing, but I think you know she could talk with you a little bit about you know how she you know identified some places and where she went and, and the reasons why. And I think what she did was do a really really good job of really trying to identify things that were important for her in terms of the school, the location, the you know what they were going to be looking for, and those types of things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I only. We'll go through that with what you're talking about. What did you learn? Tell me something, first of all, that you've learned from your dad just about recruiting, maybe that the normal kid, you told me about 10 things, but tell me a couple of things you know that maybe the regular volleyball kid doesn't know. Well, I don't think people understand how much time recruiting coordinators or just coaches spend on the road and like away from home and not even just not being with your their family, but the time that it spends to get in the car, go to the airport, then go from the airport to whatever gym they're going to or hotel or place to place. Like I don't I don't think anyone understands how much time he spends. Like let's just say he went to Utah, right? And then he goes to Idaho and it's all in one trip, but it's like so much work in one trip. And I don't think people understand that. And I just don't think people understand how much time away from their family that they really do spend. And I think learning that has really helped me like to understand maybe like certain college coaches, if their interest is stronger, are they going to, they're going to spend more time coming to my matches and being on my court, you know, like stuff like that. It's just, finding ways to understand the small details that they do because the rules are so strict, find like just ways that they can go almost around them, but without breaking them, I think it was really important. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've heard that. And it's interesting for me to talk with different schools. about what's your philosophy? And, And Jeff, that'd probably be conversation with you. I love the strategy of it, right? Like, is it the full court press, right? Like we're sending, all five coaches. Marley, is that something, do athletes really pick up on that? Um, in general, like girls on your team, do they know like, hey, Coach Johnson was here the entire match or? I think some people pick on it more than others. I mean, I would say I do sometimes, but I'm tr- I try to stay pretty locked in in the match. But, you know, after a timeout and you look over and you just see let's just say Texas, Nebraska, and Minnesota are sitting over there. Like, you definitely will notice that. Um, and I think some girls, especially the girls that were that would be, like, maybe on the bench, they would notice that and, like, maybe even say something about it. But I try to just kind of ignore all of that when we're playing. I think that that is something also that people don't really understand. Like, I think just growing up around it, it's really opened my eyes to the fact that if the school really wants you, they're going to continue to recruit you. And right. even if they think they're not going to get you, they're going to continue to recruit you because maybe in three years or two years or yeah. one year and you hate where you are, then – and you realize, well, that school had a lot of interest in me before, then maybe that will work out in the future, like down the road. And I think that's something that you've done a lot recruiting-wise and going after players even if you know you're not going to get them. 
because hopefully down the road they'll want to enter the portal. Yeah, Jeff, talk about that from a coach's point of view, just how silly. I mean, I get it. They haven't been through that, but just tell them how I would think 99% of coaches, that doesn't enter into your mind, does it? Yeah, I would tell you the one thing about social media that it, that it probably, you know, again, social media is what it is. But, you know, we talk to our players that we currently coach about their social media. And I would tell all people who are, it doesn't matter what sport, if you're interested in being recruited, be very cautious about what you put on your socials. And, and I don't mean with respect to your recruiting. I just mean the yes. things that you put out there, people are watching. And, you know, I, I can tell you that there have been a number of players who places I've been, we've stopped recruiting them because of what they put on their social media and to the parents, you know, we're, we're watching you as well. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to interject, but okay. I want to ask because I have a I have a talent, okay? I have a talent to prestige continuum. <laughs> okay? Well, I hear me out. Yep, I that's got you. The, that's the Terrell Owens continuum. Right? Terrell Owens got to make put a lot more dumb things on his social media than the five foot ten free agent wide receiver that ran a five three forty. Yes? No question. So and I I hate it, but I think we even see some examples, right? Um in the world today that it is that true in recruiting? Yeah, I think that you know you're, you're always it's like when you recruit guys, they, first of all, they need to be, you know, players, they, they need to be better than their issues. Um, if their issues are greater than their talent, they certainly can't have them. You know, I think that what we found now, because in our sport, which I think they, maybe they'll all be this way soon because of the portal, when you're bringing in so many new players onto your roster, you have so little time to try to form a team you have to do the best you can to make sure that you've got the highest level of character and work ethic. And, and sometimes maybe taking a little less talent to have a little higher character and work ethic because we are now like a G League because it's eight, nine. We have 10 new guys on our roster this year, for example. And, yeah. you know, and so when you're doing that, you have to try to balance that out. But, you know, the social media aspect is it's, you know, I, the, like what you said, you know, I'm blessed to receive my 35th offer. You know, I, it's it's you know, it's become somewhat comical, and it and I get it. I mean, people want to have their their moment in the sun, but you know, at the same time, I tell her all the time, you, know, you just need to keep your head down. You need to work, and you need to do what you're supposed to do. And you know, I sat with a, one of her teammates' dads, who he was a collegiate athlete, and and he asked me, so what you know, what would you say? You know, what, what do you think about the recruiting? And I said. You know, a, a couple things I would tell you as a parent, you know, number one, I said, look around this court. So we've sat here for two days because, you know, everybody always knows when basketball season ends because I start showing up for tournaments. And uh, I don't get to many, but I get to some. And yeah. I happened to be at one where all the college coaches were there. And I said, look around. I mean, this is – these are the, the – there's – 40 coaches that have been here. I said, this is not, they're not coming to watch a baseball pitcher or a softball pitcher who, as soon as they come out of the game, they're putting, they're looking on their phone. They're watching these kids play. You know, they play for, she plays for one of the top level clubs in the country. And I said, and her, and their person who does the recruiting coordinator for legacy, Jen Cottrell is one of the most connected and respected yes, recruiting yes. coordinators in the country. I said, so they're going to get, all the exposure and all the opportunity that they want to be able to be recruited. And so you can try to control the narrative all you want as a parent. You can try to do all these different things, but at the end of the day, they're going to get what they're going to get. And, you know, you just, I, I tell, I told this dad, I said, sit back and enjoy it because it's going to go fast mm -hmm. and I said, ask a lot of questions, do your research, but you're not going to be able to control anything. You can't force someone to recruit them. You know, she's gone through that where she's looked at different schools and they've taken setters in the class before her. And so, you know, you have to just, 
you have to just be willing to pivot and adjust. And it's going to continue to change because now with the portal, you know, you're going to see, you know, we've got one more year of the COVID stuff because there still are a lot of those kids that are lingering about because they redshirted at some point during it. So there's still a, a going to be another year of, of you know, one year transfers that are going to be out there. And so, you know, you have to do your best to identify it and know that just because, like she said, just because that situation isn't right right now, handle it the right way. I always, I mean, I always, when I recruit guys and, and it doesn't work out, I always tell them, hey, wish you the best. If down the road something changes, you know, we would always, always welcome you here in our program. Yeah, I just talked to, I just talked to somebody this week who verbal or whatever, and second year in a row, they told me about a coach that didn't get them right. And acting very, you know, almost moving them to tears. Is it? And I'm like, why would you ever do that? Hey, yeah. why would you ever do that to a 16 year old? Right. When you're supposed to be the adult, but B with the portal. And I, I hope it's not 50% of kids enter it, but in your sport, I think it's probably close. Yeah. For um, sure. You know, why would you ever burn that bridge when half of the kids will be in the portal and you can get them the second time around? I don't get that. Um, you know, Marley, let me uh, let me ask you, because you're at a club that all these kids commit. Um, do you think there's any peer pressure? Does that rush girls into committing earlier than they maybe want to because you're outside committed, you know, your friend committed now, Oh boy, I better do it. You know, I, I don't, I don't know if that's been a problem or an issue or just any sort of issue with the girls above me. I mean, I would assume probably that's, or maybe girls from other teams committing and it's like the girls on this team, like, let's just say the class above us, the 2026 is like one girl commits from Mintonet and maybe this person feels pressure to commit as well. But I just think taking your time is like really, really important because you don't want to make the wrong decision. And I don't, I don't think there is a wrong decision, but maybe in the future you could, you would regret that. And so I think taking your time would be really important, especially since we are pretty young and we still have a lot of time before we're even going to go to college. So I think taking the time you need to figure out what you want and just taking charge of your recruiting process and your journey is really important. And that right there, I've told her, that's something I I tell every recruit that we recruit. And I've told her that this is your recruitment. This is not mine. This is not your mom's. This is no one on your team. This is your recruitment and you need to take charge of it. And you need to find out as much information as you can. I've told her and her mom has told her we will help her with as much as we can. We'll take her, do everything we can to get her places like we did this summer. But at the end of the day, and sometimes it's having to do some things that are uncomfortable. Like she, there were a couple of schools that she was kind of curious about. And, you know, I said to her, like, you know, you need to talk to Jen and find out where those schools are because before we buy airplane tickets and rental cars and all that, and it was tough. And what she doesn't know is that I called Jen and talked to her about all of it and had her do some research for me. And she said, you want me to talk to Marley about it? I said, absolutely not. I said, I'm just trying to get out ahead of it so that if we need to book flights, we can. But I've told her this is her recruitment. She needs to take charge of it. Okay, so because the thing I, I talk about advocating, which is something I think you're touching on, right? Like ad, advocating. Because I, I think about um, uh, a 16-year-old in that some of only only get one Zoom, right? Um, yeah. And they're committed, but advocating with some of those coaches heck i'm i'm scared of a lot of them and i you know on that one like advocating for yourself and asking like hey what are your locker rooms like well those are those aren't the questions that dictate your college experience correct jeff yeah i think that's if people are worried about that uh they, they probably don't have i mean again it's part of it like and she and i've talked about that you know, I've asked her about like, well, why do you have interest in this school? And we talk about it. And, you know, one of the things that like I use the example of a guy I recruited who, you know, we almost lost him to Florida International because he wanted to live in Miami. And, you know, and his dad looked at him and said, 
you can go live in Miami for the rest of your life. You have, at that time, he had two years of basketball left. He's like, and you can go play for a guy that's had point guards lead the country in assists and scoring. You know, and I've told her, I said, you know, location is great. But at the end of the day, if you want to live in Southern California or if you want to live in Texas or you want to live in New York, you got the rest of your life to do that. You know, the, the, the first priority has got to be about the school and the college volleyball program because the overall experience, you're going to spend 90% of your time with your teammates and your coaches, and you're going to spend more time in that building. I mean, people, like it's, like people don't understand the amount of time that these athletes spend with one another in that building doing the things that they do. And so, you know, those other things are very important. Obviously, the education piece is important the coaching staff, finding out as much as you can. And that's one of the other things I tell the parents. You need to understand that that man or woman who is recruiting your daughter, that is not going to be the same man or woman who's going to coach your daughter. Because yes. my mortgage and my livelihood depends upon the production. And so, yes, you're going to see the best side of us until you get there. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to turn into some something. But there's going to be days when it's going to be very, very uncomfortable because my job as a coach is to push the players to places they can't push themselves. Yeah. And at times, that's uncomfortable. And so yeah, people don't, don't understand that. Don't judge the coach, right, at ice cream bait break during select camp. No question. Right? Judge the coach during the middle of a three-game losing streak and your hitting percentages. I don't even know this, Marley, but what's a bad hitting percentage in college? Anything below zero or 100 100 and below is pretty bad. Okay. In the Big Ten, when you're hitting that, then go watch the coach and that practice after you just lost to a rival and then see how they act, right? And that's college, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's how bad. I was that guy, and I got out because of that. I didn't like that, right? But I didn't act that way at camp. As a matter of fact, we were all instructed – this kid, this kid, this kid are treated this way at camp, people, right? And, and, and that's okay, right? It's, there is another side to the coaches, and it's okay. There's a lot of coaches I really like, and guess what? Today at practice, they might have raised their voice, right? Like and She's grown up with that, too, you know, and obviously playing for her mom for all these years in club and now in high school and – you know, and she's grown up around Division One basketball practices where sometimes the, the the mood and the language can get a little bit heated. And, you know, I remember her being, I think she was five years old and her sister was three and she was sitting in a practice and, and I went nuts. And one of the players was like, Smitty, your, your, your daughter's doing here. And I'm like, ah, they've heard it before. You know, you just did. It is what it is. But you you, you got to do your research on the coaches. Now, what you just said is really good. You, during their season – just follow and read their read their press conferences, read their their comments, read their and then you ask the players like you know talk about their experience. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I feel like going to these camps too is a lot of a lot of girls are scared to talk to the players, but I think that was something that I really thought was important is really because they're going to tell you the truth if they really like it or they really hate it or they like this coach and they hate this coach. Like they're going to tell you the truth, and so I think that's one thing. Like. When I was at Auburn, I had lunch with one of the players, and I really we kind of just talked about her every everything that she likes, everything she doesn't like there, what she wants to change, whatever, like what she just really enjoys. But and I think that a lot of girls don't do that, so I think that was something that would really help them. Yeah, and and the other thing is, be rational with it. Like you you weigh all of that out.